Behold, after 16 years, the post-Merkel era is upon us. Social Democratic Party leader Olaf Scholz taking the mantle to form Germany's first three-party coalition since the 1950s. How will it work? How compatible are the SPD, the Greens to his left, and the Liberal FDP to his right? Berlin's loosening or tightening of the purse strings in these uncertain times sure to dictate the tone both at home and in Brussels. Will Europe be weaker or stronger amid a COVID pandemic and spiking tensions to its east? Already there's an almighty argument brewing over energy transition in particular, whether to open the tap on Russia's Nord Stream 2 natural gas pipeline. What exactly made this coalition deal possible? As always, there's what the Germans put on paper, and then there's the art of governing as it will now unfold. How different or similar will Schultz be to his predecessor? And just how much of a new direction will it be? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at the birth of what they're calling Germany's traffic light coalition. Joining us uh, from Frankfurt, Armin Zorn, Social Democratic member of uh, the German parliament. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Thanks for the invite. Good evening. Uh, from yeah, Strasbourg, even... Michael Bloss, a member of uh, the Green Party in the European Parliament, is with us as well. Welcome to the show. <coughs> Pardon me? Yes, I know. Uh, we're also joined by Christoph Hoffmann, a member of the Bundestag uh, from the FDP, not too far from the uh, uh, French uh, uh, border in uh, Lerac, uh, just, uh, just across there in uh, southwestern uh, Germany. Uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, Cornelia Vol, Professor of Political Science at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Three parties, two months of talks, a 177-page agreement that promises state-sponsored green investment, a digital transformation, all the while a return in 2023 to Germany's strict fiscal purity. Mario Sophos has more. Two months after Olaf Scholz's Social Democrats narrowly defeated Angela Merkel's Conservative alliance at a general election, Germany's Chancellor-to-be announced a new coalition deal on Wednesday. We are united by a belief in progress and that politics can achieve something good. We are united by the will to make the country better, to move it forward and to keep it together. We are not about lowest common denominator politics, but about high-impact politics. The agreement will install the country's first federal coalition between the centre-left SDP, the libertarian pro-business Free Democrats and ecologists the Greens. At a press conference, the three parties acknowledged their differences but said that enough of a consensus had been reached, allowing them to move ahead with their plans. High on the agenda, bringing an end to the COVID-19 pandemic, phasing out the use of coal-fueled power by 2030 while expanding the rollout of renewable energy and sticking to Germany's strict constitutional debt break designed to prevent public debt from skyrocketing. This rule, suspended since the pandemic, comes back into effect in 2023. Just some of the key points on the alliance's policy roadmap, along with strengthening European sovereignty and immigration reform. As for cabinet positions, the Greens' leader, Annalena Baerbock, will become foreign minister and co-leader of the party, Robert Habeck, will take up a newly created post combining economic and environmental policy. The leader of the FDP, Christian Linder, will become Germany's new finance minister. The ministries of the Interior, Defence, Construction, Health and Labour will go to the SPD. Members of the three parties are expected to give their blessings to the deal in the next 10 days. And before we go to our panel, let's go to Berlin and uh, France 24 correspondent uh, Nick Spicer. Nick, uh, the, the optics of all those people on stage to announce this deal, what did you make of it? Well, I mean, it's historic to have a three-party coalition. This is the second time uh, Germany has tried to do it. And not to be cheeky, though, um, you know, when you look at the fault lines you were evoking in, in the introduction, it feels like the risk is they'll try at once to stop, go and yield at the same time. I mean, how are you going to have the uh, Free Democratic Party, which is against, um, you know, taxing and spending, 
govern with the Greens who want to spend a whole bunch of money in creating a green economy. There are divisions as well as regards how to deal with China and Russia with the Greens the, uh, asking for a hardline foreign policy. And then the SPD being the party of the Ostpolitik of Willy Brandt going back to the 1960s and having many, you know, Putin, Putin whispers, people who understand Putin in their party. Uh, Gerhard Schroeder, the former SPD chancellor, on that, <clears throat> a member of uh, a party working for Gazprom. So there, there are some fault lines within the coalition. And when they say, you know, we're not about a lowest common denominator, uh, I think they did have to work very hard to find that consensus. They did. They came about it uh, quite quickly, but I think it's because they took the measure of the crises uh, that Germany is facing now. Yeah, and uh, we, we heard, for instance, uh, the, the head of the FDP, Christian Lindner, saying, one thing that brings us together is we're from a different generation. Does that resonate? Well, I think he's probably talking to his electorate to a certain extent, because a lot of young people voted for uh, the FTB, uh, FTP, rather, uh, not necessarily because of their free market um, you know, views, the idea that there should be a free market or the fact that uh, they were, for instance, pro-gay marriage before lots of people, because they talked a lot about digitalization and having a better internet in Germany. You know, internet access is not very good here. And that really came to the fore during the pandemic when a lot of kids had to be schooled from home. So I think that he's probably talking to his electorate to a certain extent when he's saying uh, this is a new generation. You know, it's, it's always a new generation. But the key thing here in this new coalition government is it's similar to previous coalition governments. German voters like continuity. I think this is even though the party at the head of the coalition has changed to another Volkspartei or Big Tent Party, the Social Democrats for the first time in 16 years, it was the Christian Democrats before, I think we're going to see a lot of continuity uh, in the years to come. And just very briefly, Dick, because I want to get to our panel, uh, when does Angela Merkel uh, say adieu for good? It appears, you know, as we heard in the report, uh, there are some steps to go through in the second week of December or thereabouts. We know that Olaf Scholz, who is her successor, brought a bouquet of flowers uh, in their last cabinet meeting today to say goodbye. Uh, there's a lot of good feeling uh, about what she has done in 16 years in office, and she remains very popular, given no indication as to what she tends to do in her retirement, she said she'd like to read and maybe fall asleep. However, Parliament voted to give her nine assistants. So we'll have to see how that pans out. It sounds like she does have some plans, but isn't sharing them. All right, Nick Spicer, many thanks. And, and thanks, for, by the way, for kicking off the uh, uh, puns around the, the, the term traffic light coalition. Uh, uh, Armin Zorn, uh, uh, let's go back to that press conference that announced the breakthrough. There were a lot of people on stage. Is this going to work? Yes, I think it's going to work. But before I answer your question, let me just appreciate the moment. I think we need to congratulate ourselves on the very good uh, negotiation we have been having in the last weeks and months, and also about the tone we have been setting. I think we are. it's fair to say that we're just about to change the political culture in Germany. Um, you had, after the election, you had three different parties coming together, trying to work out and to negotiate into building a new government. And the way we just discussed the different topics that we have, was very motivated, was very disciplined. And I think we're just about to set a very new tone when it comes to political style and to political culture in Germany. And I think this is equally important or as much as important than also talking about the content. Because when we look back at the foreign government that we had, one of the biggest issues we used to have was the question around trust. And I think it's fair to say that during the last weeks, we have been able to establish a trustworthy relationship between all the different parties. And I think one of the advantages of this new um, ample traffic light coalition is going to be that uh, we do have you know, the same idea and also the same vision when it comes to the country. We do have a common understanding when it comes to what are the current topics we need to fight. There might be some differences when it comes on the way how to get there, but I'm pretty sure we're going to work closely together and find the right solutions. The, the same idea when it comes to, say, fiscal purity and returning to that a constitutional demand for a balanced budget? I mean, I would say the same ideas and the same vision when it comes to what are the current topics, what are the current challenges Germany is facing or we are facing currently in Europe. 
This is about digitization, digital transformation. This is about fighting climate change. This is about more innovation. This is about all the questions with regards to social justice, but also to migration and integration we are within Germany and Europe as well. I think we are all agree on the fact that there's a lot of things to do and we need to work on that. Of course, there might be some differences when it comes to the way to achieve the objectives. But from my point of view, and also looking back on the way we led the, the conversation, the way we had the negotiation during the last weeks, I don't think we're going to run into very critical situation that is not going to be able to be solved. Michael Bloss, you agree? I agree, uh, certainly, that we come uh, from, from different places in the society, but we are united in this idea that there needs to be a modernization of the country, there needs to be change. Um, there was uh, a very long time of conservative government that actually led uh, the country into a situation where um, not a lot of uh, things um, changed. And this this new era now, uh, it, 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 it is born today and I'm really looking forward to it. And I think that all of the three different partners have their place in this coalition. They have their projects. Um, they have the things that they want to bring forward. And, um, and we make it possible together. Can you just explain for our viewers uh, how it works? Because there's this, again, this 177-page document that all three uh, parties agree upon. Uh, but do they stick to the script afterwards? Well, um, I, this is the scripture now, and we have to stick to it. But we all know that uh, politics and life as such is developing and dynamic. So possibly there will be uh, new situations there with, where nothing was written down on in this uh, government contract. So there we have to come together and, and find new solutions. But now this is uh, what we have agreed to. I have to say I was myself in the negotiations. It wasn't always easy, no? It's not like uh, that um, we came together and uh, we had the same uh, opinion at the very first moment. So there was, of course, a lot of debate, um, a lot of attempts to understand the other side. Um, so now this is what we have come up with. Uh, but surely um, the coalition will not only be driven by the coalition agreement, but also by the spirit in which we work. And I think today we already showed that we work well together. All right, uh, lots of reactions on the hashtag uh, F24 debate. Uh, some agreeing it's a new era, others uh, uh, predicting that uh, the coalition uh, will uh, follow uh, Merkel's template. Uh, some of you, uh, in fact, uh, wrote in before the deal uh, was finalized. Uh, something tells me that FOTUS uh, on Twitter is haunted uh, uh, by the uh, uh, financial crisis of 2009, when Germany had a fiscal hawk as finance minister. Uh, he writes, hopefully Christian Lindner will not be the next finance uh, minister. Europe doesn't need another Wolfgang Schäuble. Well, he is the next finance minister. Uh, so uh, just to reassure Fotis here, uh, uh, let me put it to, uh, to you. Uh, Christoph Hoffmann, uh, will Lindner be another Wolfgang Schäuble? I don't think so. I mean, this is a new generation, as we said, and Christian Lindner is very open and he said today that we found together from different standpoints in this coalition, and it's a learning we learned from each other during the last two months. And uh, Miss Merkel uh, has finished the area Merkel now, and uh, there was a lot of standstill, and we have to clean up this standstill to modernize Germany, to getting into the position we can compete with the world. We have been lagging behind with digitalization and a lot of other things. So there's a lot of things to do. Uh, and uh, I don't think Christian Linter is, um, um, will be another Schäuble, but he will be standing for solid financing. I mean, we cannot deal with inflation. I mean, we have now five, five six percent of inflation. And so we need solid financing and trust in German financial politics. So do, what does that mean at the European level? Does it mean that, uh, for instance, those euro bonds that were issued, and it was a first, uh, to help uh, uh, deal with uh, pandemic spending at mutualizing debt at the level of Europe, is that something that the FDP will be against in the future? I don't think so. But, you know, it's, it's a matter of quantity. 
it's not a matter of if or not, it's a matter of quantity. So we'll, have, of course, I mean, we, we cannot do the spending like we did last two years. I and mean, we have to slow down a little with that. Uh, otherwise, um, we run into other financial problems. Um, but I think the, the coalition um, negotiations also showed that we have to find new sources of financement for not financing for the government. And um, there is more creative uh, creativity and there is more possibilities. And, hey, the, um, the, 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 the platform talks, for, for instance, about uh, taxes on uh, air travel. Is that something you're in favor of? Uh, you know, we said that no, no new taxes, no rise of taxes, but we will be very consequent in following up um, um, the, the crimes where, they, where we lose taxes. And uh, so there is a lot of um, lost um, revenues for the government um, when it comes to the VAT, VAT Mehrwertsteuer Betrug. Um, there's a lot of um, um, crime going on in that field, so we can have billions in that field. And like I give you an example for, for let's let's say for climate financing, um, there will be a lot of private investment in certificates to buy certificates, and these billions could go to the global south when they do afforestation. So this does not really, um, I mean, there will be a lot of investment, billions coming in without government spending. And we have to be creative to find these solutions. We have to mobilize more private capital um, for energy investment and these kinds of things. So it's, it's, I mean, the Social Democrats and the Greens came from the standpoint that the government has to do almost everything. The liberals came from the standpoint that the, the private investment should do everything. And now we found, uh, found a good balance um, in this coalition treatment. And um, so we learned from each other. And this is, has been done very professionally. And it'll go on like this. We will be very, very professional. Okay, so Cornelia Vol, you, you've heard our panelists. It sounds like it's still the honeymoon period, of course. We haven't yet had the, the swearing in. Uh, do you hear there perhaps the first kernel of disagreement? Oh. I think uh, everybody is right in underlining that this is a special moment and everybody who's negotiated can be quite proud to have achieved a contract after all. Three parties is a lot to bring into one contract. And in a relatively short period, we knew we were um, in for several weeks of negotiation, but uh, with some of the grand coalitions, uh, Angela Merkel's uh, 2017 negotiation lasted 170 days, and here we are in two months. It's not a record, but it is not long. So I think it is a moment to say we have agreement on the space of possibility in politics, and that's what a coalition contract is, and now we have to go from there. There will be disagreement. That's almost by definition what politics is about. There will be... Uh, conflict between ministries such as finance and economy and climate, which have different mandates and different missions. But we know at least within which space this conflict will be able to play it. We have some, mo some definitions to anchor what is not possible at all. Taxing uh, air transport, for example, was hotly discussed, and we know that it's, uh, it's off limits for liberals. We know that there is some room for maneuvering, and that will be playing out over the next weeks and months and years. And my gosh, when we saw the, the proposals starting to come in and we think back to what it was it less than a month ago, because we're sitting in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, when the French president unveiled uh, his plan to go faster uh, with the energy transition, Germany seems like it's light years ahead of France in that respect. Well, I, I think it would come on, be Cornelia, worthwhile. tell us I here. I think it would be worthwhile <laughs> to do a comparison of climate uh, uh, climate laws across countries. And I do have to say that um, now we have a coalition in Germany that really has this as one of their chief, uh, uh, their, their main um, ambitions to come quicker to certain points. We've heard uh, 2030, for example, for the exit from coal energy for 80% uh, renewable energy. There, there are some ambitions that I have not seen on the French side. Also because the approach was quite different. The French climate law was a very um, bottom-up process the, uh, of uh, citizen negotiations feeding on topics that were not targets but 
uh, heating of, uh, of terraces in French restaurants, for example. So you get a very different approach and it gives you a different climate law. But I think we see here that the coalition has really pushed on these issues and has come to an interesting uh, set of possibilities in the coalition context. It's, it seems very ambitious. I don't know how much of this can actually be done, Michael Bloss. Things like, what is it, setting aside 2% of land for wind farms, uh, a, a sharp increase in offshore wind farming, uh, changing the rules so that uh, uh, solar panels can be on more uh, rooftops. Uh, how fast can you go? It is definitely ambitious. 80% renewable energy um, in the electricity by the year 2030. I think um, no other industrial country is, is, is going actually in this direction. Um, but also we know that the energy transition has been blocked in the last year by especially the conservative groups. So there is a lot of potential. Um, a lot of people, they stand ready um, to, to actually do more if you think about combining farming and, uh, and photovoltaics, um, also a lot of offshore wind, um, onshore wind. So there, um, there, there are people that, uh, that want to do it. Also, actually, you know, it, it gives you income. It's, it's, it's a good investment. Um, and um, I firmly believe that, uh, that we will be able to do this. Um, however, of course, this will be now, uh, um, this will be a big transformation and, uh, and it will not go without following up. But yeah, it can be done. And this also enables us then to exit from coal and to use little amounts of uh, fossil gas to become um, climate neutral as, as fast as possible. Armin Zorn, when you hear your fellow panelists, uh, one uh, talking about, well, in this case, uh, government giving the impetus, the other saying that the private sector has to drive. Your thoughts? Well, at the end of the day, I would say it's a mix of both, right? Uh, on the one hand, we, need, we know we need some more investment coming from the state, coming from the government. And I think we do have all the measures. We do also have the necessary funds, at least for this year and next year, in order to create appetite for more investment, investment much more needed when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to education, when it comes to digitization. But we also know that the state and the government is not going to be able to finance all the transformation processes that we're facing. So we also know we need here to have the right framework to allow private sector to also do some investment and to also shape and drive the transformation that we need here in Germany. So uh, we, we've, uh, we've talked about uh, how uh, fiscal spending will go. Uh, then there's the question when you talk about the energy mix, which we've been focusing on, of, well, we mentioned it at the outset, Nord Stream 2, that natural gas pipeline that by, uh, bypasses Ukraine via the Baltic Sea, hits the mainland, by the way, in Angela Merkel's home constituency. Um, it's completed, but not yet operational. It doesn't have all the green lights at this point. Uh, Armin Zorn, for or against starting up Nord Stream 2? Yeah, as you were saying, it's not operational yet because of some legal issues, and we're waiting to have more clarification on that. But here, I want to continue with what I started, what I said before. You know, that spirit that we have been having during the negotiation, that we acknowledge there might be different interests, there might, might be different understanding on what kind of measures we need to achieve our, our goals. I want to continue with that. So what we're going to do is like we're going to continue this debate within the government, within the majority, within the traffic light coalition. But also, I know this is a crucial topic for the French government and the French society. So, and when I read the coalition agreement, I see there's a clear commitment to Europe, to the European Union, to European project, but also, but also to the German French collaboration. So I can reassure you, we're not going to have any German align gun, like any German measures where we just pressure brown and we are expecting all European countries to follow. We're going to always try to find a dialogue and find a situation, a solution that is good, not only for the people in Germany, but also for Europe. And are you for or against personally starting it up? On a personal note, I'm for. You're in favor of it. Uh, I'm in favor. Michael Bloss? I'm on a personal note, uh, not in favor. All right. Not in favor, not in favor. Again, I, I, I turn it before I, I go to, uh, to Christian Hoffman. Uh, once again, uh, Cornelia, th this is again that, that an issue, that, but it's not just France and Germany, it's all of Europe, right? On the one hand, uh, natural gas has been billed as uh, this transitional hydrocarbon. Uh, on the other, uh, we're increasing our dependence on Russia. Uh, 
how is it looking in that respect right now? And this is a key issue here. It's a key issue. And, and let's add to the conflict uh, the United States, who also has a stake in this and has negotiated quite actively with the last government on, on Nord Stream 2. To make it very simple, it's a it's an it's a complicated issue that divides the European uh, uh, partners, that divides the coalition partners, that divides sometimes within parties' uh, opinions on this as well. The pipeline is built. Uh, if you build a pipeline, it's very unlikely that you will not use it. So the question right now is, what are the conditions to grant the license for this to be operating? And we've heard Annalena Baerbock, who is likely to be Minister of Foreign Affairs, so the main person negotiating the bilateral relations around this, be very critical of Nord Stream 2 and saying we will not support, this as was the Green Party, um, an operation of Nord Stream 2 where you have uh, on the other side in Russia the operator being also the one that is delivering the gas. So we need a separation according to European competition rules between the the um, delivery and the, oper the provider on the other side. These questions can be solved but have to be solved before granting a license because, and this is again uh, citing Annalena Baerbock this uh, fall, Russia has the potential to blackmail Europe with gas prices when there is shortage and when there is an, a need for energy that Europe cannot accept collectively, that Germany doesn't want to accept, and that I think all of the uh, coalition partners uh, are, are agreeing is not going to be a good situation. So we have to find a way to make, make Nord Stream 2 deliver uh, something that can help the energy mix that is uh, desirable for all of Germany and for Europe without being a tool for foreign policy uh, against uh, Ukraine, against uh, the Central European countries that it's uh, circumvening, and of course, uh, Europe as a whole. Yeah, Christian Hoffman, you heard Armin Zorn there saying how uh, uh, before making a decision, uh, talking with the French, talking with uh, the other Europeans, uh, uh, how much do you include the rest of Europe in the decision? I think it's very important to talk to our European neighbors. And as when you see the coalition agreement, there's a lot of words about Europe. We have to bring forward Europe. We have to have a new perspective of Europe. Europe must be more sexy than it was. Uh, during the Merkel times, it was, uh, it was not really moving forward. And there was no objective um, for a couple of governments said, OK, let's leave Europe. And uh, we saw the Brexit. And we fear that there's other countries trying to do uh, little things like that again. So we have to come forward with a, with a new European policy. And uh, Nord Stream 2 is part of that. And so we have to cl clarify our relations with Russia as well, as Europeans, not as Germans, but as Europeans. And so this is very um, important for this question of Nord Stream 2. For the moment, it's on hold for legal issues, like uh, as we heard. And um, so for now, and it's not addressed in the uh, coalition agreement. So we have to negotiate on that. And what is your personal feeling on it? Should they operate it or not? I think, as you, um, uh, the other comment was, uh, when a pipeline is built, it will be used one day. But when is the day? Uh, we don't know yet. And uh, we have to negotiate on that. Also, um, our relations with Russia has to be defined uh, newly. Uh, I hope we can improve the relations with Russia. Um, but we also, on the other side, have to, uh, to have show um, that we Europeans are united. And we have, in this coalition agreement, also um, uh, confessed that we are part of NATO and we'll stay with NATO. Yeah, Michael Bloss, staying with NATO, uh, there were rumors that uh, uh, perhaps Germany would what? Would declare itself a nuclear-free zone. Uh, your, your thoughts on that being included? Was that something that uh, where the Greens had to make a concession? Um, actually, I did not uh, completely follow now what is uh, inside uh, the government agreement on this, because as you can imagine, the 177 pages uh, are quite long. Um, what is clear and what we believe in is that a nuclear-free world um, is more safe than everyone having nuclear weapons. And I think in this we um, there, there was there is some consensus also in the in the new uh, government constellation. Now, in I, I, in which direction it will go, um, I, I actually have to to look it up. And what was the um, the thing that unites us now on this? But uh, it's also clear that um, we are staying in our international responsibilities. 
um, inside the UN, inside NATO, um, and we are also in this regard um, part of a European um, security architecture. Yeah, because successive US presidents have been calling on the likes of Germany uh, to uh, spend more on defense. Uh, France's president has been calling for a European uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, it, will Germany be spending more or less on defense, you think, Michael? Well, we have actually some some challenges, uh, which is that the German army is not very modern. So there is, of course, a need to, to modernize it. But there is also a European aspect to this. Uh, in the US, uh, you are much more effective in your military spending because you do not have 27 different kinds of tanks, but you develop one. So more European cooperation really um, is, is, is positive in two ways. On the one hand, you do not need to spend as much um, into uh, research and development because you do it together with, with the other European fellows and, um, and you have a European um, uh, security architecture. So I hope that we are going in this direction. All right. And of course, there are tensions right now. Um, over the past uh, weeks, uh, we have uh, seen the migrant crisis on the Belarus border. Uh, and on that score, uh, we heard earlier how uh, uh, Christian Hoffman was saying how Merkel's often managed crisis, but uh, she's East German born. She's been able to man the phones. Uh, uh, she's been speaking with Vladimir Putin and with uh, Lukashenko. And a Russian troop buildup at Ukraine's border is also something she's been discussing. Um, she'll be missed, says the Kremlin, which urges uh, that the crisis uh, uh, in eastern Ukraine be managed following the terms of the 2014 Minsk Protocol, which brings together Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany. In just a month, there will be only one eyewitness of the Minsk agreement. That is President Putin, with four people drafting them, Poroshenko, Holland, Merkel and Putin. Would Germany be losing a little bit of its clout when it no longer has someone who's been there for so long? That's definitely a risk. We we are losing uh, the the statesmanship of a 16-year reign uh, under Angela Merkel. But uh, I I think that's also an opportunity, and in particular, the relations with Russia will be crucial. If you look at the coalition contract, uh, there is a list of bilateral relations there are addressed, and none is as long and detailed on uh, as the relationship with Russia, because there is a lot of issues that have to be addressed, and many of them were mentioned here. So uh, memory, of course, or the personal memory of the, the stakeholders um, is one, but the other is also to just list the items that need to be addressed and to have uh, an actual strategy that is developed that is not just wavering back and forth is very important. And I think the coalition partners have at least identified this and are ready to uh, continue uh, trying to find a solution in the relationship between Germany and Russia. Uh, Armin, when you look, Armin Zorn, when you look east, uh, it, it feels very volatile these days, whether you're looking at Belarus, whether you're looking at Ukraine. And, you know, you heard at the outset uh, our correspondent mention how the former ch uh, SPD chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, has gone on to, uh, to be a top executive at, uh, at, at Gazprom. Is that something that the current generation of Social Democrats is wary of? Personally, I don't think that's relevant for the debate and for the current situation, to be honest. I think when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to the relationship with Russia, I totally agree we need to have a better relationship with Russia. And I think when it comes to foreign policy, we need to be able to use a variety of instruments inside the diplomatic toolbox. You need to be able to use, on the one hand, you know, more dialogue and more to having um, um, a continuous dialogue with Russia. But on the other hand, when times are getting tough, I think you know sanctions may also be um, the right instrument to choose. But for now, I would say, and this is my personal op opinion here, we need to establish a long-term relationship with Russia based on mutual trust, based on mutual agreements when it comes to certain values that are important for us, but for Russia as well. And I'm quite sure that my political party, but also the rest of the coalition, we're going to do our fair share to have this kind of relationship with Russia. Uh, and what about China? Well, I mean, we reached a situation right now that China is one of the most biggest players on the on the global policy, on the global um, level. So it's the same that applies to China. I think we need to be able to always address 
you know, the challenges that we see. Um, we need to be able to have a frank dialogue with China. But on the other hand, I think we also need China, the entire world. We need China as a partner. So personally, I believe here dialogue is the right way to go, but still always make clear when it comes to certain violation of human rights where we do not agree to them. Michael Bloss, will it be continuity in Germans' policy when it looks towards China? Well, I think um, at least an, in one regard not. There is a new investment agreement uh, between the EU and, and China, which has been initiated just before Biden came into power. And for very good reasons, this is currently on hold, and I think it will be on hold. Um, I think we, we have to be, um, as Europeans here, um, a bit more self-assured. Um, there are very important possibilities of cooperation, but then on the other hand, there is also conflict. And um, I think it is good for Germany and for Europe to actually stand by its principles of defending human rights, press freedom, and, um, and this has to be also clearly communicated to our partners. Um, it is also a, a question in the future about leadership in, uh, in different kinds of future technologies. And also here, I think the, the coalition agreement is a good start that we are now clearly saying, you know, we want to be the place in Germany, in Europe, where uh, future zero carbon technologies are developed. Um, so um, I think we, we have, need to have, of course, good corporations and uh, they are on, on equal footing, but also we uh, must not forget who we are in this corporation. Who, Christian Hoffman, then, uh, when you look now ahead, uh, we've seen, you mentioned earlier to us Brexit and how, uh, how, that much, how that's changed uh, Europe. It's, in fact, increased the power of Germany uh, within the European Union. As you look at uh, these foreign actors going forward. Will this coalition be different from what we've seen the last few years from Angela Merkel? Yes, I think so. Um, when you look back, uh, Macron made, made a lot of um, proposals how to develop the Europe, uh, Europe. And uh, there was no answer from Ms. Merkel. And that will change. There will always be an answer. And we have to cooperate with France more intensely to bring forward this Europe. Europe is getting smaller in this big world. Russia is growing, China is growing, and Africa is growing. And so we need to find our place in this world. We need a sort of a new geo strategy. And uh, it's very important for our industry as well to have resources. I mean, if you don't look at the world, you will not have any resources one day. So we need to look at that very, um, very carefully. And you can see in the, in the coalition agreement that there is 3% of the gross national product for diplomacy, defense, and development. And this is the number we can sort of balance out uh, depending on the situation um, where to spend the money. And um, I think uh, regarding Russia, it's also clearly stated that we um, demand the human rights and democracy and um, we will not... Um, stop to demand this. And it's also clearly stated where we stand in this Ukraine conflict. Uh, right. We have to finish the Minsk uh, agreement. Um, so this is all in these coalition papers. It's all down in writing, you're saying. Before we go, let's talk about the new man at the top. Roll back the clock exactly 16 years ago, 16 years and two days to be precise. Angela Merkel, 2005, unseating the Social Democrat Chancellor at the time, Gerhard Schröder, who, uh, by the way, when the polls closed on election night, thought he'd won. The rest, as they say, is history. When you're looking uh, at those uh, images there, Cornelia Vol, uh, is this another... We didn't know she'd be there for 16 years, right? Uh, is this another one of those seminal moments? Or did Olaf Scholz get elected because he's the one who resembles Merkel the most? It, it is a seminal moment. You mentioned this is a, 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 a traffic light coalition, so a three-party coalition, which is rare. 
I would not put my money on another 16 years of this. This is we're now going into a one mandate, and then we'll we'll take it from there. But it is quite an important uh, change in governance. We're no longer in a grand coalition. I think even though we had a lot of changes, the grand coalition era is over, and that is important because it allows uh, the parties to negotiate new impulses. Um, and I, and I do think we will look back at this uh, this uh, moment and the the moments the transition that will follow. Uh, in in early December, as as a real turning point to, towards a new era, is Olaf Scholz resembling Angela Merkel most? I, I cannot answer this other than saying he was, of course, part of the uh, coalition government that she led before. There is continuation uh, on the side of the SPD, but we have two new partners who really are new into this business and who will also change the orientation in line with the SPD's conviction. So it's new. Ar Armin Zorn, uh, uh, Olaf Scholz graduating from finance minister to chancellor, a safe pair of hands. Is he too safe a pair of hands? <laughs> I wouldn't say so. I would say Olaf Scholz is a leader and he has a different leadership style. And if you um, saw the press conference today, you also saw about what his leadership, his leadership style is about. There was one question about um, where European politics and European affairs are going to be um, be managed from? Is it from the finance minister? Is it the ministry? Is it from the minister of foreign affairs? Or is it from Olaf Scholz himself in the chancellery? And his answers is actually quite representative for, for the way we're going to have, um, we're going to see the next years. He said, basically, almost everywhere where European questions needs to be discussed. And I think this is a new style we're going to have. And this is the difference than what we have in the previous year. I think this year, we're going to have much more of a collaboration between the three parties of the of the traffic light coalition, which is good. And Olaf Scholz is the right person. And I think that's also what German people wanted, you know, a Chancellor Olaf Scholz, because he brings a lot of experience from Amber, from being the Minister of Finance, but also kind of with our um, electoral platform, the topics that we put during the campaign, he's the one who got enough experience to be the one to lead us through this change that we need to have, through so the transition that is quite necessary right now in Germany and in Europe. And I think the combination of having someone with experience, but also a new traffic like coalition, is exactly what we need right now. And I want to thank you, Armin Zorn, uh, for being with us before the ink was even dry on that 177 page agreement, uh, for being with us there uh, from Frankfurt, from Strasbourg, uh, Michael Bloss uh, from uh, the southwest uh, of Germany in Lurek, uh, Christian Hoffman. Also, want to thank Cornelia Voll. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.